Hey everybody, it's Cam from the Nerdbook Review. Today I will be reviewing The Way of Edan by Philip Chase. It is the first book in the Edan trilogy. He put out all three of the Edan trilogy books last year in 2023. So if you are someone that wants to make sure you have a completed trilogy or a completed series before you start reading, then this one is for you. I'm going to do my best to follow my normal path that I do on this episode normally where I do the plot, all that good stuff before I get to the good, the bad, and my final thoughts. But I will say this right off the bat. This is a series that, um, much like Soul's Harvest by M.D. Presley, um, it's almost like Chase wrote this book for me. Now, I don't even know Philip Chase and obviously doesn't know me, but the content matter and what this book is an analog to um, are things that I studied in school, and I just had such a great time while I was reading this, so I'm probably going to do that final part a little bit different. Let's go ahead and get into uh, the um, book blurb like usual, then I'll talk about the world, uh, the main characters, all that stuff real quick. The kingdom of the eternal will awaken when the way of Edan holds sway over all of Ermanland. So say the prophecies. With unrivaled power in the gift, the Supreme Priest Bledla leads Torland and its mighty army to convert rival kingdoms by the sword and by the fang. Among the gathered resistance is a sorceress Sakara, whose mission is to protect her island and her endomaic faith from the Torlander's aggression. As holy war looms over the kingdoms of Emmerland, a chance encounter bestows a terrible curse upon a young man. Day Raven's curse may decide Ermanland's fate, but first... With the help of unlikely friends, he must survive the shattering of his world. Equal parts epic and lament, The Way of Adan is the lyrical opening of the Adan trilogy. All right, let's start off with the world. Um, what we're dealing with is a world, it's a secondary world. Um, it is kind of an analog to early uh, medieval Europe. Um, even the map, which should be up right now, kind of looks a little bit like Europe. Um, then we have like the Middle East and North Africa off to the sides. Um, the island that would be England, I guess, is down in the south as opposed to up north. But we are dealing with a religion called the Way of Edan. It'll just be called the Way throughout most of the book. It is uh, definitely an analog to Christianity. They are monotheists. They had their prophet that came and, and preached the Way. Um, and now they are in um, very close alliance with the kingdom of Torland. The, the current king of the kingdom of Torland is not a believer. He is definitely just a uh, power-hungry person who really only cares about using the church in order to further his, um, his interests and attempt to conquer the rest of the, the continent called Ermanland. And so, um, but between the two of them, think of them as like the Pope and, um, say, France of uh, the early uh, Middle Ages, where, you know, the, they, they work very much in concert. And that's kind of like how even uh, the First Crusade, um, you know, got started. And so um, we have this country called Torland, who is the largest of, you know, the countries in, in there. They are getting ready at the beginning of the story to conquer one of the other countries who kind of think of them as like Zoroastrians. Uh, I didn't really feel like it was super important to know all of the other religions other than the way because um, they're all pagans and in different places follow different gods. But the important thing to know is that they're, the other religions are pagan and the way is uh, monotheistic. So the, in the prologue of the story, the supreme priest Bledla um, sent several priests off to one of the other countries and they desecrated a temple. Needless to say, they were killed for their desecration, and that provides the pretext for uh, the Torland and the, the church to invade these other places in order to, um, you know, forcibly convert the other people to the Wavy Dan. This is important because the, the priest, uh, Bloodla is a true believer. He's a real zealot, so he's not cynical like the king is. And uh, the prophet, the first prophet said that uh, once all of Ermanland is conquered and is under the way of Edan, then it'll bring about a paradise on earth. And so he really does all of the things he does, including a lot of bad things, because he truly believes that they're going to bring about paradise on earth if they're able to conquer everyone else. 
The king of Torland does not uh, believe. He just wants to become basically the emperor, although the title's never used, funnily enough. He just wants to be a king of everywhere. Uh, if if he's, you know, conquer someone and the, the king, current king still lives, they're just going to make them a duke. So, you know, it, it's really easy if we just look at the world as early uh, medieval Europe and uh, the way as Christianity and everybody else's um, as pagan lands. Now, it's important to note that Philip Chase has a PhD and is a professor in uh, medieval history. Uh, I think they, his, on his uh, website, it calls him a medievalist. So uh, obviously this is his uh, wheelhouse. It's something that he's a real expert at. And while I only have bachelor's degrees uh, in history and theology, I studied early Christianity and its interactions with other um, religions. So it's something that I obviously have, uh, while far less expertise than uh, Philip Chase does, it's something that I really know well as also and is obviously an area that I that I care about and that I enjoy studying. And I feel like he did such a great job of um, getting that feel of the pagan lands and also like just the early medieval period. The best way to put it is, is you know, like up north, we have like the Germanic style tribes. Uh, down south, um, they are darker skinned um, and more like the, um, the Middle East, right? Like that's just an easy way to think of it. Now, it's important that I know that, like, I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm being super derivative, but, it, but it's really easy for me just to think of these places as that way. And I'm sure that that's what uh, Dr. Chase was doing as well. But it is a completely secondary world. These places, um, you know, they feel in some ways like if the magic, uh, there are trolls, there are a whole bunch of, uh, you know, terrible creatures. There's more the Germanic um, style elf as well. They're mysterious. If you come upon them, you know, then that's going to mean your death. Uh, not, you know, Tolkien, Lord of the Rings style elves. And we still have a lot of wild lands in this, at this point, and that's where like all of these monsters that were part of the myth actually exist in this place. Um, as far as the magic goes, we deal with a very, um, I would say, like 70s, 80s, 90s feel of wizards who have to chant, uh, think Lord of the Rings style, right? Or they speak in a, uh, an ancient tongue. Um, everybody, both the uh, way of Edan um, and the, the pagan witches. And so um, they actually call them wizards in that. That's the best way to, I think, to feel about like the magic system is just think like of uh, a classical wizard. And um, it's, it's very uh, prominent in the book. The uh, high priests of the way of Edan will actually go with the army of Torland as they go attempting to conquer other places. They actually will um, use um, their magic very frequently in order to to um, to attack these other places. And a lot of your strength is what you're born with, but you know you have to be able to master it as well. So uh, it's it's a really fun magic system to me. And also, it was a world that I just found so easy for me to imagine. And I know that part of that is because of my you know my background and my history of uh, what I've studied in the past. And I think that a lot of people are gonna um, find that really easy if you have a Western background. I think that's probably uh, far enough into the world. It's something that, you know, shouldn't be too hard to, to imagine what it's like if you uh, think classical fantasy with a Western bent. Uh, let's real quick uh, talk about the main characters. There are um, quite a few point of view characters, but there's three important ones or, or three that get a lot more. The real true main character of the story is a man called Dayraven. He's in his early 20s. He has the magical gift, but um, his great aunt, who is very powerful um, and is, you know, a, a definite practicing witch, she was going to leave him alone, basically, because he didn't seem to want to be a wizard. Um, being a wizard is a lonely experience. You have to uh, get rid of your attachments and things in order to really... Um, you know, become powerful and proficient in your um, wizarding ability. And so um, until he um, accidentally encounters an elf at the beginning of the story and um, falls into that elf sleep and then is somehow mysteriously brought back um, by um, his great aunt, he um, would have just become a warrior like his father and um, in like a Germanic hill fort type tribe. And um, once that happens, though, he becomes like our main character. And he's important because he actually fulfills some of the prophecy um, stipulations 
that could have made him the second coming of the prophet of Edan, as opposed to Supreme Priest Bloodla, who believes he is. And so one part of the story is going to be um, as Torland and the way tries to conquer these other places. And the second storyline is going to be um, the the way trying to kill Day Raven just in case he is the um, you know this prophet and could throw a whole wrench into things, especially since Day Raven is a pagan. The way that Supreme Priest Bloodla um, justifies this is that if he tries to kill him and he survives, then that's because Edan is protecting him, and so him attempting to kill you know uh, Day Raven is not going to work. And if he manages to kill Day Raven then clearly he was just a, another obstacle um, to test Bloodless faith. So it, it, he's going to be you know, our main character and get the majority of the page time. Uh, that Sakara, who's mentioned in the um, um, book blurb, she will be the heir to a different uh, island kingdom that's mentioned. They don't have a very big army, but they have a, very, they have a, a, a rich history of sorcerers and sorceresses. And so they're going to have a lot of people, like a lot of magical affinity, and that's how they're going to attempt to help the situation. Uh, so she is our second character. Uh, as mentioned, she's, she's, the, um, she's been chosen as the heir to um, become the queen. The way they choose it is just the most powerful person of each generation that, um, you know, with their, the magical ability, magical affinity. And then the third person that will get a lot of page time is that Supreme Priest Bloodla. Uh, he, like I mentioned, he's a zealot. He's Supreme Priest Bloodla is the most powerful wizard, basically, of uh, anywhere in the world that we're aware of, except for possibly Day Raven, um, who you know is awakened to that power after their in, his encounter with the elf, and so uh, he is very important. He, basically, he's the person, the mastermind behind this crusade that's going on. He's the one that sent those other priests off to become martyred. And now he and uh, the king of uh, Torland are, you know, setting out to conquer these other places. He and the king don't get along very well because, you know, the king's not a believer. And uh, Bloodla, the one thing I have to say about him, no matter throughout this story, he's definitely, I would call the villain of the story, but he is a true believer. He's earnest in the things that he does. If he does bad things, he, you know, he does it because he thinks that it's necessary to bring about the salvation of the entire world. And this is the kind of thing that uh, zealots of any religion are uh, famous for. But I think that, uh, you know, early Christianity was very, very, uh, maybe a little bit unique because it was monotheistic in its, in the, the, um, fervor of their early priests. One thing I, I just, uh, an anecdote that I always found it, uh, enjoyable as I was uh, in college and I would read um, accounts of early priests who were going out to the pagan areas to try to convert the pagans was that oftentimes when they were martyred, it wasn't because they were trying to preach a different religion. In fact, a lot of uh, places uh, throughout the entire world as Christianity was spread, they kind of were, they were fine with adding Yahweh or, you know, the Christian God to their pantheon because they're, they're pagans, right? They're polytheists, so they didn't have an issue with it. Where the issue and the confrontation would come into play would be because, obviously, those priests, uh, you have to have a, a certain level of zeal just in order to be going off and trying to, you know, convert other people to your faith. But the, they were, a lot of them were real jerks about it and were like, you know, you're your gods are demons if they're real at all, and people don't really appreciate that. So I thought that it was really funny that a lot of these priests, you know, were kind of a little bit jerks in their level of zealotry, and uh, that was something that I found like really early on that kind of like drew me to the book, and that I thought was something that that I personally enjoyed. Um, those are the three main characters. We're going to get some point of view chapters from um, quite a few other characters as well. Um, some companions of Day Ravens will get a, a, a chapter or two. Um, his great aunt will as well. And so, um, but the rest of them aren't nearly as important. Now, let's talk. Here's where I would normally do the good, the bad, and my final thoughts. But now I'm just going to start off right off the bat by saying that this book, as I've already said, could not have been uh, more targeted towards me if I had sat down with Philip Chase as he was writing this story. I just loved it. 
Uh, this book is a solid 10 out of 10 for me, and I really find it hard to believe that there's going to be too many more books that might uh, knock this one off the throne. I mean, we have 10 more months, basically, but I still think that this is probably going to be my book of the year. That being said, I am not going to say that this is going to be a book that everybody will love. It is a book that uh, is written more in that classical style. I mean, it, in, it's not a thousand pages like Robert Jordan's books would be or something like that, right? It is under 600 pages, and so it's definitely tighter, but it, is, uh, it does have a lot of, um, you know, prose that is a little bit more flowery. It has, you know, it's a little more descriptive, and it's definitely in like that Tolkien or Robert Jordan style. I know that I read a lot of reviews that said that it's uh, more Tolkien-esque, but I found it more uh, that Robert Jordan in The Wheel of Time would be the one that I would have, um, you know, listed. Um, religion's a bigger deal, obviously, than in Wheel of Time, but you have that, you know, early 20s um, person who might be the uh, key to, uh, you know, the whole world kind of thing. But this first book is shorter than any of the books in The Wheel of Time, and Chase did manage to uh, contain this to a trilogy, which... Uh, Robert Jordan uh, was supposed to have had the Wheel of Time as a trilogy before he, you know, just failed to contain his story and made it 14 books. But I feel like, you know, that's this is going to be more that style, right? There's that epic journey. There's the coming of age character and all that kind of stuff. So it's certainly not um, something that if you if, if you're looking for, say, Mark Lawrence or something like that, that's not what you're getting with this book. Now, I loved every part of it. I loved the the analog, the you know, the, 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 of the church, the way of Edan to Christianity. I loved how we still had that feel that was really easy for me to get into of like that Western, you know, like early medieval period. But I loved how they added on all of those creatures like trolls, uh, the worms, W-Y-R-M, uh, the, uh, there's called, well, things called the pakuas, which are kind of like little tiny goblins. Um, I actually, not too long ago, watched uh, Elena of Avalor, so I can imagine them as the little creatures in that one, if you have kids and you've ever watched that. Uh, but, you know, the sharp teeth and claws. And there's just all kinds of mythical creatures that, um, you know, come from, like, Germanic-style fairy tales and things like that. And so I just found it really easy for me to get into and to see every part of it and to really... Um, it connected with me. This story from the very beginning... Um, I guess I should back up for just a second here. The first like 8% was slow and we saw a bunch of different point of view characters and I didn't feel like it was tied together. I was like, it's beautifully written, but it kind of feels like a whole bunch of short stories. And then we hit that 8% and suddenly all those characters were important and we got into the main meat of the story and we figured out where we were going. Maybe if you're reading this book because of this review, if you don't feel it for like say the first seven eight percent so what is that of a 600 page book less than 50 pages then uh make it to a to page 100 and see because by about the time i hit you know page 50 um i was starting to get hooked and by page 100 i'm thinking like my god this could be you know a book of the year candidate for me and so i really really just loved everything about this but i but I, I do think that, that I don't know that I would recommend this book to someone who's not already into fantasy or who hasn't already read, you know, Tolkien or Jordan or who doesn't like, um, you know, the fantasy from, you know, from anywhere from the 50s to the 90s. But I am the target audience of this book and I could not have, you know, been a better target audience and so I just find that I'm maybe like it's hard for me to tell whether I, I should recommend this book to other people because I feel like I love this book so much. But a lot of that's because, you know, it, it covers areas, uh, analogs areas that are, you know, er, the, what I studied in school and what I have continued to enjoy, you know, throughout my life. I mean, you know, one thing that's kind of funny to me is a lot of this history type stuff I've even gotten into later on through reading or through playing games like Crusader Kings and, and stuff like that, right? Like, like these, it's even the kind of video games I play is uh, going, is, you know, history. You can, that one, it's just like a 3D map and you're a, basically a dynasty builder. You can start as early as the 600s at this point. So it's just one of those things, you know, where like, 
I, I, it's hard for me to tell if I should tell other people to read this book. I mean, I'm going to tell you to read the book because it's, you know, it's one of my favorite books possibly uh, of the year. And it's going to be, um, we'll see how the rest of the series goes as to whether I'll start recommending the whole series. But I loved it. And I just don't think I could have loved this book more than I do. But I also know that I'm super biased because of, of my background. So that's why I didn't do like a standard good, the bad, and, and all that stuff, right? Because um, I think if you like that, that old style, it's done perfectly. But if you don't, then you're not going to like this book. Uh, it does have a lot of five-star reviews and one-star reviews on Goodreads. And um, I, I can see why. Probably if you don't like that style, then you know, you're not going to enjoy this book at all. But if you do, then you're going to really love it. Uh, I think I should probably stop rambling at this point because that's all I'm doing now. Um, big fan. Uh, 10 out of 10. Probably going to be my book of the year unless something just comes in and... It really wows me. Um, you know, I read those Robin Hobb books right off the bat. I kind of feel like I've had a ton of five-star reviews already, but some of that's because, you know, some of the classics that I've picked up have just really uh, been great. And then, you know, I recently loved that uh, Michael R. Fletcher um, book as well. So um, I hope that, you know, that uh, I didn't ramble too long and that you enjoy this uh, review and that it actually makes some sort of sense. Um, if you enjoy my videos, please like and subscribe. And I hope you all have a wonderful day and good reading. Thank you.